Let me begin by saying how privileged I am to be here joining you to honor the memories of the recently departed leaders in the media. The roll call of these leading lights that have left us is a truly impressive one, and it can be said without exaggeration that eternity has claimed a rich harvest. These men were remarkable and outstanding, giants of their crafts in every right. While we recognize that their exit leaves a significant vacuum, this gathering serves a threefold purpose. It is at once a celebration of their lives and the illustrious tradition to which they belonged, a reflection on their legacies and an affirmation of the great values for which they stood. The Nigerian press has deep roots going back about 150 years. Indeed, the Nigerian press came into existence before Nigeria itself and was instrumental to the birthing of this nation. The pantheon of heroes of free speech as an institution is one to which all our honoraries belong, and this is a rich one indeed. Several luminaries of the anti-colonial and nationalist movements were also leading figures in the press. Namdi Azikwe, Ernest Ikoli, Anthony Enahoro, Herbert Macaulay, first established themselves as journalists of repute. Indeed, at one point, between uh, Namdi Azikwe and Obafemi Awolowo, they controlled five and ten newspapers, respectively. Considering its origins as a bastion of the nationalist struggle, it's not surprising that the relations between the Nigerian press and the Nigerian state were always largely adversarial. In the years after we gained our independence from the British, this dynamic was accentuated by the succession of military dictatorships that seized power following the collapse of the First Republic in 1966. Since military rule is defined mainly by the abbreviation of civil liberties, and in particular, the right to freedom of expression, the press found itself on the opposite side of confrontations with the military regimes of that era. The apogee of the tensions between the press and the military in the 1970s was the nationalization of the Daily Times. Those with long memories will remember the 70s as the era in which Bolabo Musawo and Edi Ade Rinoku came into their own as editors of the Sunday Times and Daily Express, respectively. Both of these giants held court as two of the most respected journalists and public commentators of their time. Who can forget Ogunsawo's interventions in the Joseph Taka Godwin Dabo affair, the cement importation scandal, or the cement armada, Kuku, Kuku and Toss Benson? the Kuku and Toss Benson tango. Eddie Adenoroku was exceptional, an accomplished poet, with compilations like Ebony on Snow, Dance of the Vulture, and the prescient Dark Days Are Here. He was one of the earliest and most influential promoters of music, of Nigerian music and entertainment. Broadcast journalism also had its shining exemplars of professional excellence with the likes of the late Ben Eguna, who was the golden voice of the network news of the Federal Radio Corporation in the 1980s and the 1990s that guided the nation through a turbulent period. A 40-year veteran of broadcast industry, he would serve as news director of the Voice of Nigeria and rise to be the director general of the FRCN and also serve as the president of the African Union of Broadcasters. But what will live long in our memories is the rich texture of his voice, interpreting national events for millions of Nigerians for nearly two decades. And there was also in that era another iconic figure, B.C. Lawrence, Uncle B's Law, whose multifaceted career saw him write a hugely popular long-running column in the vanguard 
He served as general manager of Radio Lagos from where he midwifed the establishment of the Lagos Television, which pioneered 24-hour broadcasting in Nigeria. And also, he also earned acclaim as a seasoned sports administrator. Having begun his career at the Nigerian Broadcasting Service, the precursor to the FRC, these laws' remarkable footprint of excellence spanned radio, television, and print journalism, as well as sports administration. In the illiberal and hostile climate of the 1980s and the 1990s, many journalists took to the front lines of civil society's struggle against tyranny, and they did so at great risk to their personal well-being and safety, and they used their publications to advocate democracy. Many of you in this room and your absent colleagues are veterans of that period and paid the price of voluntary deprivation, imprisonment, exile, and in some cases, the ultimate price. We will remember, of course, Malam Ismail Isa, for example, who served as president of the Newspaper Proprietors Association of Nigeria from 1995 to 2002, which was possibly the darkest era in the life of Nigerian media. And he was right there in the trenches at that time, rallying the press corps against official censorship of the press. There are, of course, many stories of how he helped many news publications to stay alive in those days. That we have a democracy today owes in large part to the sacrifices of the media, of those of you gathered here and those that have departed. These are sacrifices that should never be forgotten. As I said earlier, your departed colleagues were true giants of their craft, whose significance in public life loomed larger than their chosen vocations might have indicated. Alaji Latif Jakonde, the action governor of Lagos State, is best remembered now for serving with great distinction, not just as the first elected governor of Lagos, of, of Lagos State between 1979 and 1983, but also for numerous achievements, ranging from infrastructure to, uh, uh, to laws covering practically every aspect of governance. But even before then, he had an accomplished career as a journalist that started in 1949 from the Daily Service and led him in 1953 to join the Nigerian Tribune, where he rose to become editor-in-chief. He was the first president of the Nigeria Newspapers Association of Nigeria, NPAN. And, of course, his life has been celebrated again and again, and especially by uh, Chief Olusegun, uh, uh, by Chief Olusegun Oshoba. Tony Momo, we've heard already about him, an authentic prince of Auchi Edo State. Uh, just as uh, Mr. Reeku pointed out, his father had 257 children. All I can add to that he, is that he was the 165th child of King Momo I of Auchi. <laughs> Tony Momo's personal battle for press freedom earned him a place in the constitutional annals of Nigeria. In the famous case of Tony Momo versus the Senate, Joseph Wires of blessed memory, former Senate president, summoned him to appear before the chambers over an uncomplimentary and contemptuous publication. He had actually referred to senators as uh, glorified contractors, a, uh, a, a, <laughs> a matter which at that point was considered a grievous insult. The Senate sought to compel him to disclose his source of information. And as you've heard, Momo sued the Senate at the Lagos High Court over what he described as an attempt to infringe press freedom in the country. Momo argued that a journalist had the constitutional obligation to hold the government accountable at all times and that this duty will be jeopardized if he had to disclose his sources. The High Court agreed that an individual had the right to refuse to disclose their source of information, whether that individual was a uh, was a journalist or not. However, and I think it's important as a professor of law to correct the notion that the matter ended there. It did not. On appeal, unfortunately, 
the High Court was overruled. The appellate court held that under the 1979 Constitution, nobody, no individual, including journalists, was shielded from disclosing their sources of information, especially in exceptional circumstances. Tony Momo went on to become uh, one of the founding fathers of the APC. We'll also, of course, remember Sam and Dai Zaya, who was also another media icon whose path led from journalism to politics. Though originally a pharmacist, what earned Sam national acclaim was his forthright and uncompromising columns, first in the Daily Trust and then in the Leadership newspaper, which he founded in 2004. And he carried that principled forthright disposition into politics. In the years before and after his presidential bid in 2015, he established himself as one of the most principled voices in the media. One remarkable attribute of, the, of all of the numer uh, luminaries that we're celebrating today is the wide-ranging nature of their careers, their vocational pursuits cut across public and private sectors, and the scaled impressive heights of accomplishments in both domains. I have in mind also a man like the gentleman Malam Waida Maida, who served as Chief Press Secretary to President Muhammad Buhari back when he was the military head of state. He went on to serve as Editor-in-Chief of the News Agency of Nigeria between 1985 and 1994, before becoming the agency's manage managing director in 1994. He would go on to co-found the Daily Trust and was chairman of the board of the news, uh, paper, the news Association of Nigeria until his passage. Such was his work ethic that he was at work right until the day of his death. I'm gratified that members of the media are honoring the memory of departed colleagues today. There is a great need to immortalize those who have gone before us and ensure that their words and deeds are kept aflame as a guiding light for successive generations, especially so that younger people grasp the significance of the tradition to which they belong. And I've gone to these lengths in exploring history because the true character of an institution and the true weight of its calling is revealed by its past, by its trajectory through the times. At times it may seem that the media and the government are mortal enemies, but the occasionally turbulent nature of our relationship is, in my view, part of the natural creative tension that must exist between institutions arising from our different mandates. Those of us who govern must do so with the understanding that power is a public trust. And it is your calling as journalists to invigilate us and hold us accountable. I urge you. I urge you to do so relentlessly, fairly, and unapologetically. When we are both true to our respective callings, our democracy is strengthened. However, there is a reason why the media is described as the fourth estate of the realm. In terms of the sheer ability to influence hearts and minds and direct the public imagination, no other institution comes close to its power. You, you can shape how people think and you can interpret reality in a way that animates our most constructive public spirited instincts or in a way that summons our darkest and most destructive impulses. You have the power to elevate public debate in a way that no other institution can. It is said that journalism is the first rough draft of history. It is true that reportage shapes the perception and understanding of events. It shapes memories. And because of all of this, it can influence behavior for good or for ill. There are arguably no bigger influencers than those who report and interpret the world to us. This is considerable power, and it comes with responsibility. And I emphasize this because we are at yet another defining moment in history, the age of technology, where once 
the dissemination of news was the preserve of states and corporations. The information revolution has completely democratized the media environment. The very meaning of the term media owner has changed and no longer refers to people with the profiles of some of those of us who are here. In this era of citizen journalism, everyone now has a voice, whether through blogs, websites, online publications, podcasts, etc. The democratization of information unleashed by the information age has also introduced related, related risks with the implications, serious implications, for economic and socio-political stability. Individuals and private interests now control means of information dissemination that were once the exclusive preserve of corporations and governments who we could easily hold to account. These capabilities are increasingly used now in all sorts of malign ways by those who harbor ill intent. Fake news is being trafficked on a scale that is capable of warping the perception of reality by huge numbers of people and inducing social conflict. I believe that media leaders must use the considerable influence that you have to seek ways of achieving a consensus on the responsible use of social media. But that is a matter for much fuller discussion, perhaps another day. For the moment, these developments converge with this period of turbulence in the life of our nation. There's really no question at all that what should occupy our minds today is whether we are building up our country or whether we're intent on tearing it down. This is a question that we must ask ourselves in every sphere of human endeavor. It is the plumb line by which history will judge our generation. Because there's really only one divide at this point. is the line between those who are committed to constructive action and those who are pursuing a destructive course. Our country is not perfect, and we all know this. But the cure for her imperfections is certainly, most certainly, not destruction, nor a heedless descent into anarchy, especially as being promoted by some voices. We all have a share in the much needed work of rebuilding, redesigning, and reforming and healing our nation. Creating a commonality of purpose in ethnically diverse and culturally diverse society is challenging the world over. However, nation building is not the sole preserve of politicians and governments. In fact, it is just as much a task for civil society of which the media is an important member. The giants that we celebrate today understood that journalism operates in a social context and cannot be value neutral. This same cognitive commitment is incumbent upon all media practitioners. We are at a time in our national odyssey in which retailers of discord and merchants of strife are working assiduously against our collective potential as a people. Among the powers of the press is the ability to amplify and to drown out voices. Media practitioners have a responsibility to exercise discernment in their deployment of their platforms. In this regard, we must ask ourselves whether we are em empowering and amplifying the most insensate and intemperate and incendiary voices in our midst while marginalizing the voices of reason. Of course, the most dramatic voices are those voices that are calling for nihilism in one sh shape or form or the other. It is true that freedom of expression is enshrined in our constitution, but we all agree that society, progress, and order depend upon the, re the responsible exercise of freedom of expression and other freedoms. Otherwise, the end result will be anarchy. As we struggle to build our nation with the bricks of mutuality, plurality, and tolerance, I would suggest that those of us that stand as gatekeepers in the fourth estate must demonstrate a greater awareness of the sensibilities and sensitivities of our society. Debates over our country's future will always be intense and passionate, but they need not be toxic or polarizing. The media can help to promote a climate of civility 
in which even the most contentious national issues can be discussed in full and frank terms without degenerating into chaos. Let us reject the temptation to fracture our society and choose instead to elevate those constructive elements in our midst that can promote justice, healing, and togetherness. The media has been at the forefront of all our epochal struggles, from the fight against colonialism to the struggle to entrench democracy. A third struggle is now underway. It is a quest to deepen democracy and to realize our collective possibilities as a just, prosperous, and progressive nation. I remain unyielding in my personal belief that we have a common destiny and that we, the constituent parts of our nation, are stronger together than apart. I personally believe that all of us have a stake in advancing the cause of justice, of equity, and progress. This is a task that is incumbent on everyone. The media leaders in whose names and memories we have gathered today are giants precisely because they understood the struggles of their times and they embraced their roles in them. In so doing, they wrote their names in gold and remain reference points for succeeding generations. Today, we too must embrace all of those quests that are before us to make common cause with progressive nation builders across all divides to take ownership of our country and build a sustainable future for our children. Finally, let me commend uh, the MPO and BON who conceived of such a memorial, a, mer a memorial of such taste and magnitude. Among our people, there's a common saying that the care or loyalty demonstrated by those championing our causes when we are no more when we are no longer there or when we are no longer present is more genuine than the obsequiousness of those engaged in eye service when we are still in a position to pay back so for this let me salute so for this let me salute the exemplary leadership exhibited by the npo and the bon with this you have really lived up to expectation as the ultimate custodian of the finest traditions of our media tradition. Very well done. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening.